Most or many uh, people think God is a big pushover, though. God is love. So love has to accept everything. I don't believe that's so. I believe like every good dad, he wants to bless his kids. How many people know that God wants to bless us? He wants to bless us. But like every good dad, he doesn't want his kids to take the blessing for granted. What he's done for us. Give thanks with a grateful heart, I believe. Give thanks to God. He prayed a horrific price for our salvation, for our deliverance. The Bible says, as we all know in Romans 8.31, it says, If God be for us, who can be against us? We know that what can separate us from the love of God? God loves us so much and He cares for us and He wants to pour out His blessing upon us. We talk about can persecution, can death, can peril, sword, principalities, powers. The Bible says, no, in all these things we are more than conquerors. They're amazing words, they're amazing promises. And yet many times, we the church, people, can live a defeated life. And sometimes we have an opinion, we blame God, we, we think it's all His fault that we might be going through some troubles, but I want to tell you that if God be for us, who can be against us? You believe that? So Father, today I'm asking you that you will help us to to, Lord, to break the strongholds of the enemy that get around our mind. Lord, that we know that you are a loving God and that you want the very, very best for us. We also know that your word declares it's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. And, Lord, it's a hard attitude where we come and honestly, sincerely just come before you and say, God, I'm sorry for what I've made it. I want you to help me to be strong. I want you to help me to triumph over every work of the enemy so that every one of these promises that you've given to me will be mine and that I can be a living testimony to my family, to those around me, to anybody that comes across my path, that God, you are an awesome God and you are a rewarder of those who diligently seek after you. And Lord, I pray that we would be a people that would seek after God. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto us. So Lord, I pray that you'll teach us your ways, not the ways of man. Lord, not the ways that perhaps in our mind we've been programmed. I pray you'll reprogram, pre reprogram us today, and we'll give you all the praise and all the glory. Amen. So Romans 8.31, amazing words, amazing promises. Only believe all things are possible. And so I want to ask you the question today, what do you believe? What's really going on in your mind? You see, what you believe will mold your life. What you believe will, will cause you to become that which you believe. As a man thinks or as a man believes in his heart, so he shall be. Whether we believe right or whether we believe wrong. So you can believe right, you can believe wrong. Whatever you believe today, you will get a result. If you believe you're a failure, if you believe uh, you're the black sheep of the family, if you believe you're not loved, you will live according to what you believe. You act out what you really believe. In some cultures, say the Aborigines, if someone points a bone at them, they die because they believe that so strongly. And I think that it just brings to the reality that there's an enemy out there, but there's also a belief system and if you really, really, really believe something, it can happen. And though we today in our world might think how strange or how can that happen, it really happens. How many people know that that really happens? Someone points a bone at them, they die. Some believe in sacrificing babies will please their God. There's many, many beliefs in this world that we live in. We Christians believe in a God who created man in His image. 
In His likeness, He created us. A God who wants to, wants to bless and protect us. I believe God wants to really, really protect us from every enemy that would come our way. All He asks is that we come to Him. Come unto me. This book is full of amazing stories. Stories of great kings and great champions and men and women of God that have triumphed over the enemy. But you see, it's our believing system that we've got to somehow or other allow the Word of God to come in, mess with it, take out all the junk. I think we've had that prophesied this morning. Get out all the rubbish that we can think right. Because you see, God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. We find here in the, in the, the Bible, in 2 Chronicles 28, 24, there was a king by the name of Ahaz. He was a young man. He became king over Judah. But what happened is that he did evil in the sight of God. And he provoked God to anger. See, as a Christian, I can take myself out from underneath the spout, we used to say, where the glory comes out, underneath the spout where the blessing flows, and take ourselves out and live out here somewhere, a God who wants to abundantly bless and abundantly pardon, a God who wants to love me with an everlasting love, He wants to supply all of my needs according to His riches in glory, He wants to heal me, He wants to deliver me, He wants to make me the head and not the tail, He wants me to triumph over every work of Satan, which He has already done as we went through communion today, He has defeated, He has triumphed over the devil. And He wants us to live in the victory that He's created, but you and I can step out from that and step over here and we wonder why things aren't going right. We wonder why things aren't happening the way they should happen. And so here is the children of Israel, the, the people that God loves so much. And in the, in the prayer meeting this morning out the back, I was reminding myself that w this whole thing about humans, this whole world, everything about it is God's idea. <laughs> God created this thing, it's His idea, and His plan was to be a blessing. His plan was to have fellowship. His plan was is to supply. His plan was to be a father. But here's the children of God, the children that God loves so much, and the king, uh, he comes on the scene, he does evil in the sight of God. He leads the people of God into Baal worship. They they make images and they begin to worship all these things. This guy actually went into the house of God and broke down the altars. He broke down all the good things of God. He shut the doors. And another way, what, and that, what really happened was he shut the way for men to be able to come to God. And they started to uh, worship uh, all these false gods. And so the hand of God was not upon them and, and their enemies came in and triumphed over them. Their enemies came in and took them captive. Friend, the reason the enemy can take the church captive is when we close down the altars, when we close down an, our approach to God, when we try to find some other way to meet with God. And so here we find that after this period of time in 2 Chronicles 29 verse 1, a man by the name of, a king by the name of Hezekiah comes on the scene. And Hezekiah does what was right in the sight of God. The first thing he did was he started to, he opened up the doors again. And we know we've heard the scripture and it says, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. And God is opening, is knocking on the door of the church. He's knocking on universal. He's knocking on the door and he's saying, can I come on in? Will you allow me in? And today we even use it that God is knocking on the door of your life. 
And he's saying, Lord, will you let me come into your life? Will you let me really come in? Will you let my word speak to you? Will you let my word reveal to you the folly, the troubles, the things that are not pleasing to me? And as Hezekiah, as he did what was right in the sight of God, God started to bless him. God started to speak to him. God started to meet with him. And the blessing of God was all over these people now because they've come back to God. Friend, we've got to come back to God. We've got to find God in, in, that, in that area. It says there that King Hezekiah, in verse, let me just have a look to Chronicles 31, verse 20. It says, King Hezekiah did what was good and right and true before the Lord is God. Hezekiah set himself to seek the Lord. And if there's one thing that I would love to be able to say to this church, this people, right now, friend, seek the Lord. Seek the Lord. Amen? Set yourself to seek the Lord. That doesn't mean you've got to become religious or some super spiritual person. It just means that you start to seek God in a new way. Start to do some things that are a little bit different. He began to seek his Lord. Hezekiah set himself to seek the Lord. He did it with all his heart and God prospered him. And here it is that God is there and God is blessing. And, and what happens now is that we get this sense of false security perhaps. We, we now think that we're bulletproof. I know of a young couple of guys there that are in Bible school. And they're Bible school students, so we're bulletproof. They went up to uh, this place, and uh, one of the, it was an Aboriginal uh, grave area, and one of the Aboriginal men that were there, they said, don't go in there. We're Bible students. <laughs> we can do it. I want to tell you, this guy came home. They said in the bus he started to convulse. He started to scream. He started to shout. Friend, I want to tell you, there are some places we just don't go. Amen? Some places there that we, we, we're just not bulletproof. We might have got blessed. I might have found my car key. <laughs> God might have been great for that, and that's great. But I just can't say, well, now, hallelujah, I can do whatever I like. Because God blessed me there. He's going to bless me no matter what I do. Because God, I believe, has got certain requirements for the church. And I believe the closer we get to Jesus' return, the more that God is going to require of us. That's why I say to this church right now, if we want to fulfill the requirements and if we want to fulfill the destiny and the purpose and the plan, if you personally want to fulfill the prophetic words that have come over your life, if you want to see King Jesus ruling and reigning over the Sunshine Coast, if you want to see a move of God, set your face towards Him and start seeking God with all of your heart. And I believe God will start to make a way and God will start to do things. And here's Hezekiah, and he's, and he's come into this place where, where the blessing of God is all over him. And it says here in 2 Chronicles uh, 32, verse 1, it says, after these deeds of faithfulness, after this, I'm going to say this once, and after that I'm going to call him uh, Sam. <laughs> Sen mac e rib <laughs> king of Assyria, came to make war with Hezekiah. Why did these people get all these names? Funny names. Where was Jim and John and Fred and Frank? <laughs> he came to make war against the king of Judah, Hezekiah, God's people. Now Hezekiah could have said in his heart, he could have got all upset, what have I done to deserve this? There's not one person here that's ever said that to God. What have, you know, he could have got, I've been doing this, I've done that, I've done this, and now look what's happening. There's an, friend, I want to tell you, while you have got breath in your life, you have got an enemy out there 
just waiting for an opportune moment to see what he can do to destroy your relationship with God. There is, but I want to tell you, greater is he that's within us than he that's within the world. The greater one dwells within us. Do you believe that today? So he, he could have been complaining. I can remember as, even as an unsaved person. I'd be, I'd, I'd be in a hurry going somewhere. Might have been going to pick Nancy up to go to the movies. And I got a flat tire or something. I can remember vividly. And I didn't even know God. I'd heard about him, but I'd say, I'd look up to heaven and say, what have I done to deserve this? And I didn't wait for the answer. Oh, I, many times I things, if I hit my thumb with a hammer or as a carpenter or as a printer, oh, my, what have I done to deserve this? And I'd say a few more adjectives. And, and things like that. But then on another time, I'd be sitting on a rock with my old hand line out there, fishing, and then all of a sudden I'd put on this other persona. Oh, God. <laughs> Would you help me catch a fish? <laughs> oh, God. Help me catch a fish. So here... Just because we're saved doesn't mean that hairy legs isn't going to come around and try to cause trouble because that's what he does. That's what he does. You see, if you think wrong, you get a wrong result. If, if you think it's God that's doing things, it all goes haywire. John 10.10 tells us, that we've got a thief, Satan, who comes to rob, to kill, and to destroy. But then Jesus said, but I've come into your life that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. If we think wrong and speak wrong, we get the result that we're confessing. Confessing that you're sick all the time, guess what? You get sick. But see, what, but what did Hezekiah do? As soon as the enemy came around, he prepared for battle. He gathered his leaders. He gathered his commanders. And he gathered the people. And he said to them in 2 Chronicles 32 verse 7, he says, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid nor dismayed before the king of Assyria. While you're prophesying this, I'm thinking you've read my mail. Don't be afraid, but be strong and be courageous. Do not be afraid nor dismayed before this king of Assyria, nor before all the multitude that is with him. For there are more with us than with him. In other words, what he was saying is, really, he was saying, don't be afraid. Don't look at what you can see. Don't look at him don't look at the multitude, which most probably outnumbered them many, many times. Don't look at that. Don't look at what you see. Don't let that get inside you. Prepare yourself. Get ready. Know that there's going to come a fight, but be strong and be courageous. They're more with us than with him. With him is the arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. Friend, we've got to start to understand and we've got to start to get ourselves back underneath the spout where the glory comes out, get ourselves in that place where God can come down and reign and rule and be supreme that no weapon formed against you can prosper because that is God's will for our lives. That is the will of God. And it's no good just uh, allowing, saying, oh, well, praise God. You know, God didn't do it. No, God always does it. 
But if we're not under the spout, if we're not in his position, well, then he can't do what he wants to do. But if we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then all the things that he's ever said and ever prophesied and ever spoken will come to pass. And I want to tell you, hell will have to freeze over before God's word will become naught. God's got a plan, friend. And whether you know it or not, you're part of the plan. He's just got to get a hold of us. He's just got to get us. And the first thing you can do is just start to seek the Lord. Seek the Lord. We think wrong, we get wrong results. But if we be strong and very courageous, he said, with him is the arm of flesh, but with with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. If you read on, you find that, that Sam, Fred or Jack or Jill, the king of Assyria, did everything he could to steal Judah's faith in God's word to them. He came on the scene and he sent uh, different ones in to, to, to speak his word. He said, I've destroyed and I've captured other nations. None of their gods was able to stand before me. What I've done to those, I'll do to you. Your God. And he started to, to, to curse the God of Israel. Bad move. Started to curse his God, told, told them that, his God, that, our, that our God was no good, wouldn't do this, wouldn't do that. Came in and, and tried to pull down everything that the man of God had said. Everything that God had promised them. The Bible says in verse 20, it says, Now because of this, King Hezekiah, And the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, prayed and cried out to heaven. I'm going to tell you, friends, I believe there's a time to pray. There's a time to cry out. Listen, can you imagine this? Here here it is that this this Sam guy is coming in and blowing his trumpet. I've done this. I've done that. I'm so much bigger than you. I'm going to starve you out. He had already besieged the city. He'd already had his plan intact. He's already done this most surely many, many, many times. It was his way of attack. Now he comes into this city. He's, gonna, he's just going to take it. All I've got to do is cut off their supply. It's just a matter of time. I want to tell you, friends, the church today is cutting off its major supply, the mighty Holy Spirit, the mighty power of God. We're taking the blood out of our sermons. We're doing this, we're doing that. But I want to tell you, not in this house. Can't talk about the cross. I want to tell you, friends, the cross, the cross, the cross. It's at the cross, the hallelujah, the cross of Calvary. The blood that was shed on that cross sets us free in Jesus' name. Then he said, I'm going to go back to heaven. And when I go back to heaven, I'm going to send you the mighty Holy Ghost. And when the mighty Holy Ghost comes, you're going to be filled with the power of God. You're going to speak in other tongues. I tell you what, shakarandi mandara sototai. Oh, hallelujah. We're going to talk in tongues more. Amen. Because when you talk in tongues, you're speaking mysteries under God. You're edifying yourself. The poor old devil doesn't know what you're saying. Gee. Confuse him. I've destroyed, I've done this, I've done that. Now because of this, Hezekiah and the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, prayed and cried out to heaven. Verse 21. Then the Lord sent an, an, what's an? An angel. The Lord sent an angel. (laughs) Oh dear God, you've got a sense of humor. Here's Sam out there with his multitude of an army, besieged the city, 
got everything all set up everywhere where he's got all this, he's got all the boasting, he's got every other nation that he's ever destroyed, he's got all the confidence in the world, and he's up there blowing his trumpet, and God sends an angel. (laughs) God sends one angel. (laughs) We've got to get this, friend. It can help you build your faith. We are surrounded by angels. Amen. Glory to God. He sends one angel. Why why didn't you send a thousand of them? (laughs) One angel. You know what the Bible says? One shall put to flight one thousand. Two shall put to flight ten thousand. That's us. I don't know how many, just one angel. One angel. Then the Lord sent an angel who cut down every, everybody say every, every mighty man of valor, every leader, every captain in the camp of the king of Assyria. So he returned shame-faced. How many people know that that God wants to put the devil to shame on your behalf? If you seek the Lord with all your heart, if you go after God, if you go after Him, He will direct your path. He will lead you. He will empower you. He will anoint your life. He will give His angels charge over you. Man, I want to tell you, there's too many fat angels. Every mighty man of valor, every leader, every captain. And he went home shamefaced to his own land. And when he had gone into the temple of his God, some of his own offspring struck him down with the sword there. He came in as a big champion. See, in Jeremiah 33, this is what it says to us, verse 3. Call unto me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. Call unto me and I will answer you. Friend, I want to tell you, we're living in a day when we need to call unto him. And he said, I will answer you. These, These guys, these guys, Isaiah and, 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 and Hezekiah, They got together and they began to pray. They began to seek God. They started to call unto God. And God sent an angel. And the angel went into that camp and started to destroy, started to pull it down, started to smash it down. It's it's a time we need to call unto God. I believe that there is a war raging for the sons and the souls of men and women. There's a war raging. Satan is pouring out his fury and his wrath on the nations of the world. There's famine. Do you know this today? That the waste in America alone, food waste in America alone, is enough to feed every starving person worldwide. I didn't work these stats out. Somebody else did. There's drought. Do you know today that there is so much water that is wasted? But today we cannot build a dam because there's a little insect that lives in that sand and we might destroy it and there's not most surely one in a thousand Australians might ever see that insect. And when they do, they most surely swat it. (laughs) Stupid. We're led by educated idiots. Earth, we've got a little insect that we want to protect, but our farmers out there are doing it so tough that daily they're hearing of suicides as the banks ravish them, as this world system goes crazy and it can be fixed easy.
earthquakes, floods, mudslides, wars and murders, countless thousands of good, innocent people are tragically lost. Many good people blame and turn their back on God. I don't know if, you're, if you ever witness to people in the streets. You say, what do you give your life to Jesus? You say, how could I do that when God does this? All the starving people in there, all that, why does he allow that? And yet they most surely voted for abortion at 22 weeks. Call unto me and I'll answer. Friend, there's got to come a change. There's got to come a turning. 2 Chronicles 7.14 says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. Humble. Aussies don't like that word. They think it's a sign of weakness. Tough Aussies. And yet, we know deep down we're all about as tough as custard. All our wives have to do is just come up to us. And you know that little lobe on the bottom of here? <laughs> you start to touch that a little bit and we melt. What do you want, dear? That door, that door I've been asking about. Yes, dear. <laughs> that, that thing I want fixed up. I get into more trouble when I fix it up than I do if I leave it. Because when I leave it, it's there. But then when she gets hold of my pinky and and I say, okay, and I get up and I go out there and I grab my screwdriver or whatever I've got to do. And then two minutes later, I'm sitting back in the chair. She said, what, what, what happened? Aren't you going to fix the door? I said, it's fixed. <laughs> it's taken me months to get you to do something that took you two seconds. <laughs> so I get into trouble again. <laughs> Church, I just want to say to us, let's seek God. Let the presence of God come in. Let the anointing come in. We've got time in this place to worship God, eh? We've got time in this place. There's people all over this country that, that need God. We used to sing a song a long time ago, People Need the Lord. People Need the Lord. Broken Lives. It's a beautiful song. Um, I forget you used to sing it. People need the Lord. Broken Dreams. People need the Lord. There's mostly people here today and you need the Lord. There would be people here today and you need that closer walk with Him. You know, perhaps... Circumstances, situations have caused you to, to back away a little bit, not really trust, think wrong. No matter what you think, you get a result. Some will take us into the failure and defeat, and some will take us into victory. Some trust in chariots, some trust in horses, but friend, there's only one place to trust, and that's him. Just wonder this morning if you could bow your head with me. I believe the Spirit of God is in this house today and wanting to draw people to himself and gather people to himself. If you've been shut away, walked away, don't know God, never met God, know you're not right with God, know you're not living where you should be with God, whatever it might be, We've heard about the covenant today that says all you've got to do is just come back. 
What amazed me is with when Hezekiah did what was right in the sight of God, immediately God just came in. Even though generation before that had served Baal and pushed God out. And sometimes we serve our emotions and our hurts and our disappointments. We don't go and serve Baal, but we serve something. We serve brokenness, hurt. And that's kept us captive. It stopped us from coming to the knowledge. But when Hezekiah came on the scene and he did what was right in the sight of God and he opened up again the doors of the, of the house of God and, and made room for God, God just came in and blessed him. And friend, you don't have to go and do 25 Hail Marys. You don't have to go and spend three months in purgatory. You just need to come to Jesus. You just need to come to Jesus. Come unto him. Give him your life today. Told you about my dad last week at 82 years of age or 84, whatever it was, of rejecting God. Opened his heart and let the king of glory come in. I don't know where you live today in your own heart, in your own life, but I just know that God's calling people. It's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. It's the goodness of God that touches us. It's the goodness of God that's touching your life right now. And if God is touching your life right now, and He's calling you, drawing you, wanting you to come under that His everlasting arm, wanting to, He's wanting to embrace you, wanting to love on you. Perhaps you've had an opinion that said that's rubbish. But right now you sense the Holy Ghost touching your life and you want to make it right with God. Would you just quickly slip up your hand? Can I see your hand today? I'd love to pray with you today. Would you respond to what God wants for your life? The devil's most surely had a field day in the past. It doesn't mean that you're not saved. It just means that you want to come closer. You just want to, you may not be saved. I don't know. The last time we're going to ask, if that's you today, would you just quickly slip up your hand? Say, that's me today. I want you to touch me. I want you to minister to me. Amen. Well, we're just going to stand to our feet then, and uh, we're just going to let God be God. What I'm going to do, though, this morning, if you're here, and you know that perhaps already you've, you've had that touch and, and uh, you've come out already on an altar, but you know that, that God's got a purpose and a plan for your life and, and, and you really want to just see that fulfilled. And uh, you, might have, you might already have that in your heart already because of that amazing uh, um, altar call we had before. But I just want to make room if there's somebody else here today and, and you just need that touch, you just need that assurance. You might just need God, to, you might just need to say, God, just come and touch me. Help me.